Hello and welcome to South County Spotlight on Frontier Community Access Television. As we wind down the summer of 2016, a couple of things to talk about in the local news. Certainly uh, a lot of discussion over scams continuing to dominate the headlines. The last time we spoke, there was a discussion about changing some personnel on the South County EMS Board of Oversight. The Deerfield Board of Selectmen decided to appoint themselves as the town's representatives to the SCAMS Board of Oversight, removing Matt Russo and Mark Gilmore. Mark Gilmore, of course, the former selectman. The Matt Russo removal was somewhat more controversial. As you know, Matt Russo has been involved with SCAMS since the outset, and he was considered to be an integral part of that board. His removal has created some controversy, certainly caught the attention of a number of media outlets, including The Recorder, which did a recent editorial about the upheaval with scams, specifically the involvement of Deerfield and Deerfield's seeming unwillingness to accept the idea of the organization moving to Waitley. The Russo non-reappointment resulted in a very interesting moment in Sunderland Town Hall recently. We'll take you back to a recent Sunderland Board of Selectmen's meeting. Select Board Chair Tom Fidenkevitz, who has not always gotten along with Matt Russo, but has served with him on the SCEMS board for quite a while, did something kind of unusual and kind of nice. He was willing to step aside to allow Matt Russo to represent Sunderland on the SCEMS board. Fidenkevitz tried to convince the Deerfield Select Board Chair Carolyn Ness to rethink the decision not to reappoint Russo, and when she didn't, he took matters into his own hands. And I asked if, if he could be, if they would reappoint him because of his critical um, knowledge, knowledge that that man has. Um, it didn't happen. Um, I can say that at the, the last meeting Thursday night, Matt did show up, and I, I know he's not going to desert it, but I did make the statement, and and I haven't talked to David and Scott because we can't talk to one another because of our open meeting law. But my opinion, um, if Matt cannot be a member, um, I, I offered, and I talked to Matt about this, I offered to resign and appoint him as Sunderland, rep, as Sunderland representative. That is my personal um, belief, strong belief on how much he affects our South County EMS and the operation. Fiden Kemet's offer was reacted to by the Sunderland Board of Select and his fellow two select board members who thought it was a good idea. And that led to some more discussion and some more questions about Deerfield's motives for removing Russo and Gilmore. Well, I, I, I applaud your uh, generosity and I agree with Matt's in not just his institutional knowledge but passion for the service. I think it would it's be a, a very it's, big it's, loss. It's, it's an amazing I, loss. <laughs> no, it's I, actually, you know, I got, a, on hubris. I got a question for you guys. Do, do you think that, for an instant, that Matt would vote to do something contrary to the betterment of the service? Not and if we're better in the service, aren't we making it better for the town of Sunderland? Deerfield and Waitley. Well, and, and that for me has been the guiding <laughs> principle for this whole thing is the service that we provide. And you look at the statistics, uh, all you have to do is read the reports and they yeah. bear out what it reinforces the entire goal of why we set this out. Yeah, it is. And, and the charter to do it. And, it's and all about service. My, my, only, my only, and I said it at the last meeting, my biggest, my biggest problem is that we're, we're not thinking, we're not, we're not addressing the needs of our staff right now. Now, the Sunderland Board has not taken any action on Fiden Kevitt's offer as yet. Uh, the Board of Oversight has asked the town to wait a couple of months to make a final decision. Russo, for his part, said he had no problem stepping aside if that was going to progress, if it would make the organization move forward, although there are people that feel like the organization would move forward better if he were still part of the mix. And I think he'll still be involved, but at this point he won't be Deerfield's representative. He may wind up being Sunderland's rep. Now, the Deerfield selectmen have said they will likely leave once a decision is made on the new home for scams. Whether that will be in Waitley or Deerfield seems to still be a matter of conjecture. Certainly we will follow it and uh, see where it, the, the conversation goes. But for right now, I think what Fidenkevich did was really a, an outstanding 
an outstanding move, an outstanding gesture, if nothing else. And we'll see if that gesture is accepted. Turning to Deerfield, the town of Deerfield recently held a meeting regarding the condition of a Mill Village Road property owned by Matt Gilmore. Matt Gilmore, of course, is the son of former selectman Mark Gilmore. And one of the concerns has been the condition of that property, which has been a source of complaint by a number of residents of the town of Deerfield, especially residents that live in that area, which is basically a residential area. But the concern has been that maybe there has been an illegal business being operated out of that area. The selectman held a public hearing where a number of residents in the area got a chance to speak. Matt Gilmore did not attend that hearing. So the board called a special meeting recently to have Matt come in and his father Mark joined him. And in the first cut here, Carolyn Shores Ness, the chair of the select board, spells out these specific problems with the Matt Gilmore lot and why they need to be addressed. That one of the sky lifts have, is gone, that the blacktop and the concrete piles are gone, that you're working to fill the dumpsters. Um, I wanna give you credit for that. And it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, but there are some other issues that haven't been addressed. One of the issues is running um, your contracting business um, out of um, your address and there's no home business permit for this at the moment. Um, there are some parking of commercial vehicles there still, and we have, are still receiving complaints about running vehicles, um, your trucks. So what I'd like to know is what's your plan, um, and what is your side of the story on this, because we haven't had any discussion with you before. Well, all the equipment on site is also being used for the progression of the site. Um, there's over four feet of grade change, um, and yeah, it's on my property. And I've neatened it up and brought in everything from this line of sight from the road off the road. Um, and I don't have anywhere else to take it. I don't have any money to spend to take it somewhere else. So. That's where I'm at. Also speaking was Deerfield Building Inspector Dick Kalaszewski, who said that Gilmore's trying to fix the situation. They're, actually, they're trying to do their best to correct a bad problem. And this also ended up with former selectman Mark Gilmore weighing in. This was very interesting. You know, we came in on Friday, and Doug and myself, and Kip had a conversation, and he he, I believe he followed through as much as he could do in those few days. And I guess the only questions that I'd have would be, you know, just tell me when you're going to do something else. Uh, seems pretty simple. I mean, for example, and I'll just use this if you don't mind me talking to Matt. No, I use fine. this like, you know, some plan when you're going to get rid of the next sky lift, for example, or we're going to get it out of sight, something like that. When the motor's finished, and I can take down my trees. Okay. So, did you move it? The question. Mm -hmm. Tell them. Yeah, it's out of sight. Okay. Completely. So. I, I guess, I don't know how I'm getting into this question answer thing, but, uh, but I guess the question I would ask if I was sitting up there would be time frame for some stuff and just write down dates and stuff that you're going to get things accomplished. And if you can't make a date, and I'd be going back to these people and saying, I need a little more time to finish this or finish that. I agree with them. I think that it needs to be amicably resolved, but you can't be chasing windmills in the, you can't be chasing windmills. You can't be running around trying to fix everything when he has limited funds to do so. You shut that off. Um, and he took off a week of work to meet the, what the intent was, I think. Um, for cleaning it up, um, and the, as he said, the vehicles he's using or he's using on the road, on the property to do the work you want done. He doesn't have any place else to store them, and as, as he gets money, he will correct all, all the things that he needs to get done. One person who is not convinced at all that there's been progress at the site is Kip Camosa, a new selectman who has been really pushing the issue quite a bit 
And he believes not only that there is not enough work being done to improve the property, but he believes there is still a business being operated there. Last week when we spoke, there were three dumpsters there. There's two dumpsters there and another, some sort of slide off container. And there, there's another truck. There's a skid steer, a loader, and an excavator. More stuff keeps coming. And the whole idea was to clean this up. And I understand you're going to say that we well, can't clean it up without this. But you have enough equipment there, you could do the whole thing in a week. I, I, don't, I don't get it. You know, it just seems like, you know, not enough has been done. You need to load those containers up and bring them to some place where they can be kept, not there. You need to load up the tractor and take it someplace where it can be kept, not there. You know, if you, don't, if you can't find a place for it, then you either have to rent land or sell them. You know, you, you, it, this has been going on for a long time. It didn't happen last week or last month. You know, we've got over a dozen uh, complaints from the police department. Um, you know, you've gotten letters over the last six months, and, you know, the only, the only thing that has been done is, well, you know, I need more time. I, I don't have any place to put it. You know, the, the people around me can suffer, and, well, you know, I've got the right to do this, and I don't have the money, I don't have the time. You know, and, you know, as a community, we all have to live and work together. And you created this, and it's not up to Dick to make a list or us to make a list. It's up to you to resolve it. Sounds like community. Excuse me? Sounds like community. Thank you. One of the key questions is, is there a business being operated on that site? Now, the selectmen have rejected an application by Gilmore to be allowed to operate a construction business in what is essentially a residential neighborhood. And Carolyn continued to press the issue of the business, which prompted a somewhat interesting response from former selectman Gilmore. People do perceive that there is a business happening, and based on the complaints that we're getting, um, that some of them has been documented by the police that there is activity that is not related to site cleanup there. And, you know, that has to end. That is really important. This is a residential neighborhood. And there is no permit to, be, to operate a business there. Do you understand, Matt? I mean, nope. this is... That's fine. You don't understand, Matt? No. Can you shed some light on that, Matt? How, how, how does this how do that make I'm sense? Gonna have to, I'm going to have to get some advice before I speak about that. Okay. Yeah. I just wondered um, if you could just... I, the only thing I'll shed on it is the fact that when he moved there, he got what he thought was a business permit. And he's informed some time ago that he didn't have one. Right. And that it had to come through the Board of Selectmen. Because yep. it was misissued by your office. Don't no. go there. Don't yes. Go, don't, don't go there. <laughs> Please, I think just don't go there. Yep. So there was a um, misunderstanding, which we still don't know the definition or the aspects of it, because a home business is not a business permit. And people that we've talked to in different arenas do it different ways, and different towns do it different ways. So mm -hmm. I have yet to see any bylaws or laws or something in there that describes what that process is and what that, per what that permitting process looks like. And it's taken me a long time to get to this thought process because I was confused about that aspect of it because I've been sitting in those chairs for a few years. Um, we authorized home business permits where people took chunks of their home and turned it into businesses. Mm -hmm. We didn't see a lot of, and to the best of my knowledge, I don't remember seeing a business permit come in front of the Board of Selectmen. So it was confusing. Okay. And that's where the confusion comes from, just to answer your question. And again, not right. to blame anybody for mm -hmm. anything because it's a small town and everybody's trying to do a good job in what they do. Mm -hmm. And they deserve credit for the fact that they do a good job here. So that's the just to answer your question aspect of it. I, I, I guess I'm confused because my understanding is that Matt registered his business with the town clerk. Right. But that's it. There was no permit issued. We Registering it as a doing business as 
Okay. It's different than having a permit to do anything. All right. Mark, you were on the Board of Selectmen. You knew nothing was, nothing came through our office. There was no application. I want, I want to see, and, and we'll, we'll deal with that later on. I, I apologize for my ignorance, and I apologize that if what my recollection of sitting in those chairs is incorrect. But we did home businesses where people took chunks of their home and turned them into businesses. Mm -hmm. And those are the only permits that I saw came through, with the exception of awful, for permits for licenses for businesses, for licenses for everything else. I signed a lot of licenses in my, time, my tenure there. I never saw what you're talking about. And if I did, I apologize because I got confused with which one of those items I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. because it became kind of a daily routine process. But to the best of my knowledge, what I was looking at was not what was being betrayed. So it confused me, and I didn't know how to answer the question, and I didn't answer the question. But I did ask, but I did ask several people for the forms and stuff of that nature, and it got shuffled under the... It just didn't happen. And it's okay. my responsibility to make sure that it did happen and it didn't happen. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that the guy's lying. I, I just, I find it hard to believe that a former selectman doesn't understand the difference between a home business and a home business permit. I think that that much time on the board, you would have to know that a permit for something like that would have to be issued and it may even require a special permit from a zoning or a planning board to be allowed to operate. I mean, there are certain regulations that are just universal and home business regulations and permits are pretty standard and the fact that there wasn't one uh, and there seems to be some disagreement as to whether or not anything was issued or there should have been issued that was issued but the bottom line is I think that Mark Gilmore knows better than that. Now Matt came back before the selectmen on the 10th to discuss this and it was reported that there was good progress being made on cleaning that site up and I've driven by there a couple of times and and actually it does appear to be a lot cleaner there doesn't appear to be as much stuff around so Clearly progress is being made, so I don't think the board's going to impose those $300 a day fines they had been talking about imposing. So that's good news for Gilmore, and uh, it makes it less likely that the town of Deerfield will wind up somehow owning that property, which I think, uh, as Carolyn said, would probably be uh, the wrong move for the town at this time. Deerfield Selectman also seemed to want to exercise greater oversight on how the town spends its money. The board at that same meeting said they do not want any expenditure over $4,000 to be spent without going in front of them first. The following is an exchange between the board and town administrator Doug Finn on that matter. There is already a, 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 a something which addresses this in the bylaws um, that any purchase of $4,000 or more uh, regardless of uh, appropriation for it, must come, uh, must be publicly posted for a week in the front lobby. Uh, that someone must actually post that information, um, and it must stand posted for a week before it can actually be purchased. That's part of the town bylaw. That's actually one of the bylaws that we're hoping to change because well, it's extremely restrictive. It makes it very, very difficult to, well, to conduct business, and that's above and beyond any requirements imposed by Chapter 30B, the public procurement. Where, so. where was that posting for our new tractor? For the new tractor? Uh, we actually, uh, that's a really good question. That's, I don't think it was That's done. why I want this so it comes across okay. our desk. So any purchase over $4,000 yeah. you would like to come yeah. before you for approval prior to purchase? Right. You well, simply need to set, tell us to do that, and we can do that. I, I had some question on the 4000 because, you know, when we appropriate money for, like, computers or software systems or whatever, I just wanted to make sure that there are a couple people looking at it. That's all. Are you talking me. about any new purchase? Are you talking about any payment? No, new purchase. Any new purchase. And, new and purchase. the reason for that is that it's one thing to appropriate fifty thousand dollars for software that's going to do a b and c what i want to make sure is that when that's ordered we're getting the a b and c we're not going to get the cdf you know and it will it's compatibleness that i just you know and i'm not claiming to be uh, a computer expert i just want to know that what we were what we okay. were intended to get is what we're getting and not adding we're, on to it we're All talking right. about moving into the future doug we just want okay. 
to make sure that what Capital Improvement Committee has voted on, what the town meeting voted on, and what we're authorizing as expenditures, just double checked by somebody, and it's us as the. You know, any, and it's, and I, any I'm not purchase saying, of equipment and, and equipment, anything, or vehicles, or anything over four thousand dollars would you just. And it, it's not that we're going to second guess it. Just I want to look at it to make sure that's what we intended it for. I don't want I don't want to see you know it get inflated. Now I understand that every board of selectmen wants to have a certain level of financial oversight that comes with the job. You want to be able to know where your money is being spent. I, I get all that. But there's managing and then there's micromanaging. And what happens the first time Kevin Scarborough, the highway superintendent, has to buy a load of fill or a load of salt or sand that exceeds $4,000? What happens if the fire department or the police department needs to buy some kind of emergency equipment that exceeds $4,000. Every department head in the town has some level of discretion. And also, what does that do to morale among your department heads? Your selectmen are basically saying, look, anything over $4,000, we want to have final say on it. Not necessarily that they're going to veto the spending, but it almost sends a message to your department heads that, hey, we don't really trust what you're doing. You've got the job and you've got the discretion to operate your department, but as long as it doesn't go past a certain dollar figure, and I... I kind of get the feeling that this is something that Henry Camosa has come up with, and, and I have no problem, like I said, with being fiscally prudent. But there's fiscal prudence, and then there's overdoing it. And I tend to think that this might be overdoing it, but we're going to find out as this policy is implemented whether or not it is, in fact, something that is logistically tough to implement. But certainly we'll know, and we'll follow it, and we'll have more to say about this in a future edition. Also, uh, we had Steve Kulik on this week to do a a wrap-up of the legislative session on Beacon Hill. And one of the things he told me uh, is that the Beacon Hill delegation, of which he is a member, is going to file and is filing for intervener status regarding the Berkshire Gas Moratorium. As you know, Berkshire Gas put a moratorium in place on new ga natural gas hookups. And they did so because I think they figured there was going to be more natural gas capacity coming to the area with a new natural gas pipeline. That pipeline project obviously has derailed. So Berkshire Gas still has this moratorium in place. There's still no new way to get new supplies of natural gas in. And the people that represent the towns impacted by that moratorium are not very happy. And some of those towns exist right here in the Frontier District. So Kulik, Senator Stan Rosenberg, Representatives John Seibach, Paul Mark, both of whom have been on this show, Ellen Story and Peter Cocott, are filing for intervener status, which would give them legal authority to go in and ask questions and probe into exactly what Berkshire Gas has done to fix this moratorium and get it lifted. Now, I maintain what I've said before in the past. You can't just create new natural gas supplies out of thin air. If you could, we wouldn't need to have talked about having a, a natural gas pipeline. I think what happened was, though, is that the Berkshire Gas Company put all of its political eggs in one basket expecting that this pipeline would go through and they wouldn't have to worry about conservation or finding new measures and new ways to get more gas to their customers, thereby being able to lift the moratorium. So I'm not sure where this is going to go, but it's an interesting story and certainly we're going to follow it and I'm sure we're going to have uh, uh, Stan and, uh, and Steve Kulik on again to talk more about it as we go forward. But it's been an interesting summer and as we speed toward fall, more things are heating up and we'll be here to talk about it as much as possible on the South County Spotlight. That'll do it for this week. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Collins for all of us here at FCAT. Have a good day.